James 2 is a very useful passage when it comes to trying to preach the gospel out there. A lot of people believe in work salvation. A lot of people use this passage. Um, some very common passages in James 2 are used. So I think it's very important. I've preached on James 2 multiple times over the year of our church. I still get people asking me questions about James 2. So, you know, I, I think it's a good idea to keep covering it because it's one that will come up a lot as you go out and preach the gospel, especially with other Christians or, you know, other Christians that you know, are believing a works-based salvation. They'll often quote verses on James 2, but normally I only go from verse 14, but today we're going to be going from verse number 1 and talking about the first half of the chapter as well, which is maybe not so familiar to you. Okay, so let's jump right into it. Respect of persons is the first section. James 2, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with respect of persons, right? So one thing I just want to note there is, you see how he, 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 James here, when he's writing here and he mentions the Lord Jesus Christ, you see here also that he mentions the Lord of glory. I mean, he, he realizes who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, is the creator of all things. And, uh, you know, one thing I want you to reflect on this morning is, do you realize that? You know, do you realize that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory? Because sometimes we take the name of Jesus Christ. You know, we call ourselves Christians. You know, we know who Jesus, you know, we say we know who Jesus Christ is, but do you really believe it? It's like when we say we believe in a hell, but do you live like you actually believe in hell? <laughs> you know, there's an actual hell that exists. Or do you live like Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory? Right? Do you show him the respect he deserves? Do you show him the effort and the diligence that he deserves? You know, like when you come to church, when you do things for the Lord, are you doing it for the Lord of glory? Or do you say you're doing it for Jesus Christ, but you treat him worse than like, you know, your boss at work. You treat him worse than other people that you know in life. You know, you need to think about these things. You know, often people will say, you know, if you were to go visit, you know, you would get an invitation to go see the Prime Minister. You know, maybe that's a bad example. But, you know, you get somebody noble, right? You, you get an invitation, you know, go see the President of the United States. Or think about some person that you really respect in the world. It's like you get an invitation to go meet them, to go sit with them, to eat with them. What's your attitude going to be like? You know, are you going to treat it like today? Are you going to be late? You know, you're going to show up late, you know, you get invited to some important person's dinner, you're going to show up late, you're going to come in, you know, you're going to disrespect them, you know, you know, things like that. Well, hey, maybe we need to think about that when it comes to Jesus Christ. Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. That's what we're mainly going to be talking about. I want to just stop there. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. So we're talking about two different statures of materialistic wealth, right? Well, the funny thing is, you know, I don't know, you know, if you guys read this passage and just see yourself there, because I'm like, they come in, you're selling a man with a gold ring and, uh, and goodly apparel, you know, we're like, you know. So, so, I mean, by this definition, you know, remember, we are all rich. According in the Bible, when the Bible talks about rich people, I mean, we are rich. We are prosperous. We are more prosperous than most people in the world. So think about that when you are complaining about how bad life is. Complaining about how bad you have it. Oh, you know, look at my house. Like, hey, at least you've got a house. At least you've got, you got a bed. At least you've got clothes. You know? So, you know, we, we think about, we read in the Bible, when we talk about rich and poor, and really everyone in this room is rich. You know? Because we're the ones that have goodly apparel. Right? We're the ones that have jewellery. Right? And here's, there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. And you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. Now obviously this word has uh, changed meanings over the years. So it doesn't mean homosexual clothing. He's not coming in with like skinny jeans and you know, coloured hair. You know, he's coming in with you know, good clothing. How, gay in, 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 in uh, the word actually means happy. right? But they've just tarn the homosexual agenda has just tarnished these words, they tarnish the rainbow, they tarnish the word gay. Gay just means happy. So he's wearing good clothes, right? And say unto him, sit thou here in a good place, 
and say to the poor, stand thou there, I sit here under my footstool. So what I want you to understand with what it means to be, what does it mean to have respect of persons? Right? Because what it's not talking about is like honouring people legitimately for godly reasons. Right? So it's not, it, this verse is not saying that it's, it's always wrong to t- treat people differently. Right? The question is, why are you treating them differently? Right? So the respect of persons is when you have the outward appearance, you know, you're treating people differently based on their outward appearance or their outward wealth, their physical wealth. Right? But there is respecting people more based on actually godly attributes. And I'm just going to go to one passage, but there are other passages in the Bible. I want to show two, but just take the time, just go to one. First Thessalonians 5, look, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labour among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, look at this, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. So the passage in James is not saying it's always wrong to hold people in high regard, hold people on. The question is, why are you holding them in high regard? Why are you honouring these people? Are you honouring them for worldly reasons? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, material wealth, you know, whether they're handsome or beautiful, you know? Or are you honouring them because they serve the Lord, because they love the Lord, because they're a good example of godly attributes, Right? Things like this. So it's not that. So James too is not teaching that respect of persons is just having respect for people in general. This term in the Bible is referring to having treating people differently for the wrong reasons, right? And the reason that we're obviously given in James is that you treat somebody nicer because they're rich, and you treat somebody worse because they're poor. He's saying, oh, somebody comes in and they're rich, and you go, oh, you don't have the seat at the front. You know, have nice. You know, like the, 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 the churches that are on TV nowadays, all the rich people sit at the front because that's where the cameras pan. Right? And we all the nice people and rich people at the front. And then they're saying that the man that comes in in vile raiment, he goes to the rich person, sit down in a good place, say to the poor, stand thou there. So he's like, you don't even get a seat. Or you can sit down where I'm resting my feet, next to where I'm resting my feet. So sit here under my footstool. Right? But that's not what respect a person means. Look at, if you look up respect a person in the Bible, you can see it's about judging people the wrong way, right? But judging people is not wrong in general. We all have to judge, make a judgment on things. Deuteronomy 16, 18. Look at this Old Testament judge. Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes. And they shall judge the people with just judgment. See, so judgment is not wrong, but the judgment has to be just. Thou shalt not rest judgment, right? What does that mean? Like twist it, pervert it. Thou shalt not respect persons, right? So what does it mean? Neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. So you see how you, they have to judge justly, so they do have to you know, make a decision and discern and things like that, but not to do it the wrong way. And this is why respect persons is there. Neither take a gift. Right? Ephesians 6, And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So masters, in, you can know, think of masters, a bit different to employers, employees, but it's so like employers and employees today. So it's like saying employers, hey, treat your employees right and have no respect to persons, meaning don't um, you know, be partial towards them for the wrong reasons. But obviously, if you pay you know, a worker more because they're doing more work, that's not respect to persons. That's actually doing it justly, do you see? So he's saying here, masters, treat your servants in a just way, not having respect of persons. Why? Because God does not have respect of persons. Right? So it's about looking on the inward and judging justly, not judging unjustly. That's what respect of persons is about. And we're given that example in James. And it reminds me of this verse here when God is talking about looking for the successor to Saul, right? And he's looking for the son of Jesse. Remember, Jesse brings out all his sons, you know, and you know, but it was David that was chosen. Now look at this verse here. This is a very good verse about David. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but Lord, the Lord looketh on the heart. Right? So this is what James is kind of referring to. Like we should judge justly. Right? So you see how when God was looking for a king first, when he picked Saul, he did... He was sort of making a point, like Saul was chosen because he was head and shoulders above the rest, 
right? But he was also a godly man at the time too, Saul. But this time David, he's saying, hey, I'm not looking on his countenance, you know, the way he looks, or how tall he is, you know, because God's not looking on the outside, he's looking on the heart, right? Let's continue, James 2 verse 4. He says, are ye not then partial in yourselves, which means treating people differently for the wrong reasons, right? In yourselves, and I become judges of evil thoughts. Now, to me what I like think about, because every time I read this, it just didn't make sense to me, because it's like, you become judges of evil thoughts. So how, if they're doing this, are they judging evil thoughts? Because they're the ones doing evil. But I think it's just the, the language here, that this judges of evil thoughts is not saying that they're, it's the evil thoughts that they're judging. Think of it as you, you are judges that have evil thoughts, right? So if you're judges of evil thoughts, I always read that as they're judging the evil thoughts. But no, it's saying when you have respective persons, you are a judge with evil thoughts. You're a judge of evil thoughts, right? It's just like, you know, and, and it's kind of going back to that Old Testament passage where he's trying to say, hey, the judges in the Old Testament are not to have respective persons, so you as Christians are not meant to as well, right? All right, let's continue. The poor are rich in faith. James 2, hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them <coughs> that love him? Now, when I read this, it reminds me of the Beatitudes. You remember the Beatitudes? Because what is he referring to? And I believe what he's referring to when he says, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and look at this, and heirs of the kingdom, which is promised to them that love him. Because look at what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So notice that James is referring to people that are actually poor, right? But Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Because it's not like everyone just has to be poor, because you can have good things, but be poor in spirit, right? So that's what he's encouraging people to do. So, obviously, it's easier to be poor in spirit if you actually are poor. It's a lot more difficult to be poor in spirit if you're not poor. And this is why it's a more struggle for, the, for people that are rich, like us, to be poor in spirit. But the people that are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what James 2 is referring to. Heirs of the kingdom which God has promised him. So, what's interesting here is he's saying God had chosen the poor of these, this world rich in faith. So what's interesting is that it seems as though like God has actually given more faith to those that are poor in this world rather than those that are rich. So sometimes you think, is it, what's the cart and the horse? Is it because people are rich that they uh, you know, um, don't have more faith? But here it's actually saying like, you know, he's chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. And what that reminds me of is you know, in Romans 12, verse 3, we see here, and, and usually we go to this verse because of Calvinism, but it says here, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So you see here, God gives everyone a measure of faith. Right? And that measure of faith can grow. Like We can increase our faith. But you know, everybody has faith. That's why everyone can put their faith on Jesus Christ and be saved. But we do actually start with different levels of faith. So some people, you know, you know may find it easier to, to, to put their trust in God and, and, you know, follow his commandments more than others. That doesn't mean that we can't grow in our faith. But what it made me think of is when I compare that to the passage we were looking at in James 2, when he's chosen the poor rich in faith, you know, maybe what God has done is actually given more faith to the poor than to the rich. You know, and there's actually different measures of faith, but everyone has been given faith, but the measure might be different. All right, let's continue. James 2, verse 6. But ye have despised the poor. So you see how God actually favours the poor in faith. So he's saying here, but, you know, we shouldn't do the opposite. Right? We shouldn't, like, you know, we, God has actually done, given, given the poor an advantage spiritually, so rich men already have a physical advantage in this world. And he's saying, well, you shouldn't even then just give them the spirit, you know, like, a, like even more advantages than what they already have because we're doing the opposite of what God does. But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? We say not only in addition to you doing the opposite of what God does because God has favoured the poor, you're despising the poor, but then also the rich men 
do evil things to you, and yet you still honor them more than, than, than poor people. Isn't that interesting? You know, and I think we, we can see that. Like we honor you know, rich and successful people so much, and yet they're the ones that often are doing the most damage to God's kingdom and doing the most damage to the gospel. So he's like saying, what do, you, what do they do here? He says, do they not draw you before the judgment seats? What does that mean? It's like, aren't they, you know, because they have the money, you know, whenever they can sue a lot easier, you know, they can hire the lawyers. So they're, they're probably a lot more litigious, you know, they, they're more protected because, you know, when they drag you before the judgment seats, you, have, you may have to represent yourself, whereas they, you know, they got the lawyers and all that sort of stuff. So they, they use the law to their advantage to oppress the poor. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which he had called. So not only do they oppress you legally, they're saying like, but they, they blaspheme the very God. Remember the Lord of glory that you take name by. Why do you honor them so much? So we're not saying that every rich person does this, but obviously more so the people that are evil in this world and the ones that are trying to gain money and power and the rich ones, right? So we don't want to necessarily honor them more who the people we want to honor are like we read in First Thessalonians, right? Those that are serving God. Those are the ones, um, you know, uh, Paul says Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was very sick. He sent Epaphroditus to go help the Philippians and he was like almost nigh to death. And he says to the Philippians, these are the sort of men that you should hold in high regard. Hold such in reputation, he says those words. Let's go on. Transgressor of the law. So now he ties this into, you know, if you just treat others the way you want to be treated, then you'll do well, right? And he's saying if you have respect of persons, you're breaking this royal law. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So he's saying if you just keep the golden rule, here it's called the royal law, that you love your neighbor as yourself, then you will be, you should be fulfilling, you know, not having respect to persons. But he's saying here that he's trying to tell here in James that when you have respect of persons, you are actually breaking the second greatest commandment, which is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You commit sin and are convinced of the law's transgressors. Look at what Jesus says here in Mark 12, 29. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And look at what he finishes. There is none other commandment greater than these. The reason why I put this in here, I wonder if this is why he calls it the royal law. You know, because there are these two greatest laws to love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. It's kind of like saying these, these, and another place he says on these two laws hang all the law and the prophets. So that's why I think he's referring to them as the royal law because this really sums up all of God's commandments. And he's saying if you have respect of persons, you're actually breaking the second one. So it's, it's a serious thing that you're doing, right? Um, let's go on. James 2, For whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So now he's tying this into, you know, it makes you a transgressor even though... You know, you haven't um, broken everything. If you offend in one point, you're still a sinner. We often use this, these verses to explain to people that this is how God sees things. See, once you've broken the law, it's not that you're good enough to get to heaven. If you've, if you've sinned, you already come short. You already are not good enough to get yourself to heaven. That's why it doesn't matter what sin you do, you've become a transgressor of the law and sinners need to be saved. So he's saying here, if you, even if you keep the whole law, but you break one, he's not saying here, when he's saying you're guilty of all, he explains later, right? You become a transgressor of the law. Often people misuse this passage because they use this passage to say, oh, well, if you've broken one law, it's like you've committed every sin, which is not what it's saying, right? What it's saying is it's just you, you are guilty of all, meaning you broke the law as a whole, right? But that doesn't mean that if you, like, tell a lie, that's the same as, like, raping a little child or, like, murdering, like, you know, hundreds of people. It's not saying that. But people often use this verse to mean that, and that's not meaning that, right? Because not all sins are equal, right? There are smaller sins and greater sins, you know? And this is why even in the Bible, in the Old Testament, you have lesser crimes and greater crimes, you know? Because otherwise, why isn't every crime in the Bible just punished by capital punishment, right? But 
when it comes to being a transgressor of the law and being deserving of hell, one sin is enough to make you a transgressor of the law. But we even know in hell there are differing degrees of punishment. So we don't know exactly how that all works. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So he's saying even if you don't break every single commandment that God has given, if you've broken one commandment, you've disobeyed God. You can think about it that way. You're a sinner. You're disobedient to God because you have transgressed the law. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Right? So he's saying, <coughs> <coughs> For he shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. So a couple, two things here. One thing in verse 12 is you'll notice that in James 1, it was, the Bible was also referred to the law of liberty. Right? And he's, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth there. Right? So here again, he calls the word of God the law of liberty. Now, I want to just give you some perspective here. Because, you know, the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And, you know, oftentimes when people, they become a Christian, and they, they have this impression that God's laws are, like, so restrictive. Right? And they say, like, oh, when you become a Christian, they say, like, oh, you just, you can't do anything fun anymore. Right? Which is not true. Right? What you, what you can't do, and what you shouldn't be doing anything, anyways, are the things that are sinful. Right? So, yeah, you know, maybe you have to wake up on Sunday morning to come to church. But, you know, most people wake up earlier to get to work. You know, they wake up like 6, 6.30, 7 o'clock to get on the train and travel an hour, hour and a half and train to get to work at 8.30. Right? But then people complain and they say, oh, it's so restrictive. You know, because you have to go to church at 10 o'clock on Sunday, right? But normally, you normally... Be, so, so they think about that. Then they think about, oh, but I can't do it. Like, oh, now I can't get drunk. And now I can't, like, just, just sleep around. I can't do all these fun things. Well, but what they don't realize is all these fun things, quote-unquote, actually destroy your life, you know? And they destroy a lot of things. And people that go into those things, they're not truly happy. They don't get to, they don't get to experience the joy that living a godly life brings. And often it brings you into bondage, addiction, you know, depression, you know, uh, you know, just broken relationships and all these sorts of things, right? So this is why when you see like, you know, the law of liberty, like it actually means that, you know, it's making you free from the sinful addictions. But also God's laws are not that restrictive. You know, even God's laws in the Old Testament, like people, like, you know, they always scoff at the Old Testament, like, oh, God has all these laws. And yet, all the laws that God has, you know, because remember, the Bible is a thick book, a lot of its stories, a lot of its repeating things from the old application of the Old Testament and the New Testament about Jesus' life and all these things. So, you, so if you actually look at how many laws there are in the Bible, I mean, you can, I mean, the fact that you can fit all the laws, even in the Bible, 66 books, I mean, compare that to the laws we have in Australia, where they fill libraries full. So have this idea, when the Bible says the law of liberty... You know, don't think like, ah, oh, you know, but God's so restrictive. He's not restrictive. You know, and this is why, you know, God's society is, is actually quite libertarian in the sense. It's just not humanistically libertarian that there are some social things that God outlaws, right? But God, for the most part, gives a lot of liberty, right? And that's why, you know, like maybe different churches have higher standards than others and things. But think about it. Every church, I mean, God does not prescribe how a church should run. So this is where there's liberty, because there's liberty for churches to decide how they run and how liberal or how strict they are. Right? It's the same in your family. So anyways, law of liberty. Verse 13, what I think about here, I'm reminded of Matthew 7. He's saying here, you've got to, be, you've got to think about, because remember we're talking about respect of persons, how you judge, you've got to be reminded that you know, God's going to treat you the same way. He shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. It reminds me of Matthew 7, right? often a misquoted verse. Judge not, that ye be not judged. Verse 2, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, shall be measured to you again. So, like the, you know, it's like going back to the royal law. You know, how do you want to be treated? Well, treat others that way 
Do you want people to be merciful with you? Be merciful to them. Do you want people to judge you for the inside and not the outside? Well, then you should do the same. You should have not respected persons. Okay? All right, let's get on to unprofitable faith. James 2. This is a more familiar side, but good reminder, good lesson if you're not so familiar with James 2. James 2, 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and hath not works? Have not works. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things that are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith that hath not works is dead, being alive. So um, you, we'll, you'll see this a few times in James chapter 2. And really, the wrong interpretation of James 2 is they're saying that this, this phrase, they are saying, means that if you do not have works in your life, then they'll say your faith, your faith is dead and therefore you are not saved. That's basically what they're saying. And really, it's just a, a way that people try and use this passage to teach work salvation. But what I want to go through today is to show you that this is not what James 2 is teaching. And if you understand what the Bible teaches on this topic, you'll see very clearly that it's not. But you just gotta, we just got to ask a few questions, right? And understand really what it's saying. Because sometimes, sometimes when you read a passage, you're not really thinking about what it's actually saying. You read over it, you, you think you have a general gist of it, and then you assume that's what... The verse is saying but then when you actually look at it the words within the verse then it starts to stand out a bit more at you <coughs> it says what doth it profit now first you gotta ask the question who is it profiting right because they're assuming that the prophet is talking about does your faith profit you for salvation right but then what's the context of the passage who is who is it profiting to when it says what does it profit is it saying is your faith profitable to you or is it saying is it your faith profitable to somebody else if, though a man Say he hath faith. So notice here, it's not saying, what is the problem, my brethren, though a man hath faith. Right? It's saying, though a man say he hath faith. So already here, I think we can see in verse 14, that the question, and, and if you understand what, what our position is on James 2, it's about your faith in the eyes of men. You can already see here in verse 14 that it's about interactions between two people because it's a man saying he has faith but you don't really know if he has faith, right? It's not the Bible saying a man has faith and has not works. It's a man saying he has faith and have not works and then ask the questions, can faith save him? And it's a question, it's not a statement. It's not saying that faith can't save him. It's just asking the question. So if you ask the question, if it's talking about salvation, well, can that faith save him? Well, it can, because faith without works, like we see in Romans 4 later, can save him. But if it's talking about, but this could be talking about Physical, right? This may not be talking about a physical, uh, a spiritual salvation. So what is it referring to? Is it physical saving? Meaning if you just say something but you don't do anything, does that help you physically at all? Does it help somebody else physically at all? Well, what is it? Well, I think if we go on to the next few verses, that question is answered of what the context of verse 14 is. So verse 15. If a, bro if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? So you see how it says, What doth it profit? So doesn't, wouldn't that link it in with verse 14? And isn't it talking about physically helping another person that has a physical need? Verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So he gives an example, which is a physical example of helping somebody else who's in need, and then he says, this is what we mean by your faith is dead <coughs> if it has what works. Now notice, it's the faith that is dead. It's not the Christian that is dead. Right? Now, what does it mean when something is dead? Does it mean it's not existent? Does it mean that, it, that, it's, that it's not there? No, it doesn't mean that it's not existent. Right? The faith is there, but it's dead. Right? Romans 4, 19. And being not weak in faith, this is Abraham, he considered not his own body, now dead. So his body was existent, existent but it just was dead. Right? But what, what does it mean here when it was dead? It, it does not even saying that Abraham was dead. When he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. See how the Bible uses this word dead not to mean that it 
doesn't have life, but also that it doesn't bring forth life. Right? Because Abraham was not physically dead, but he didn't, wasn't having any children. Sarah's womb obviously was not dead. You can't have a womb inside you that's dead. It's going to kill you, right? So, but what's, what, what does it mean by when it's dead? It didn't bring forth life. And this is what I think of when the Bible uses the phrase here in James 2, when your faith is dead, it's not profiting anyone else. It's not bringing forth fruit, right? But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That doesn't mean that you're not saved. That doesn't mean the seed, remember we talked about the power of the sower, didn't go into the ground. But if it's dead, it didn't bring forth fruit, right? James 2, verse 18. Let's continue. Yea, look at this again, a man may say. So you see again, it's not saying a man has faith. It's saying a man may say. Why? Because he's stressing the point that it's interactions between two people that can't see each other's thoughts and faith. A man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So who are they showing it to? Are they saying, I'm going to show God my faith by my works? No, they're saying, I'm going to show you. Because why? Because we cannot see each other's faith. The way we show it is by the things we do to other people, because we can't see another person's faith. We can see our own, and God can see ours. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So a lot of people will use verse 19 and say, ah, look, the devils believe, but they're not saved. But are the devils believing on Jesus Christ? Is that what that says? No, he's saying the devils believe that there's one God. Right? Now do us well. The devils also believe and tremble. So it's, he's not saying here the devils aren't saved because they don't believe on Jesus Christ. He's just saying devils believe that there's a God, but, you know, that, that's, that doesn't mean that, they, that they're, they're good, right? It's the same with us. You know, we can have faith, doesn't mean, mean we're good and fruitful. But that also doesn't mean we're not saved, right? Because he's talking about devils here. Right? And, the, and the context is about how we are profitable to other people. Right? Not whether or not we're saved or not. So, it's not saying here that devils believe on Jesus Christ. And they can't, even if they wanted to. James 2, but wilt thou know of amen that faith without works is dead? So now you understand, as he's repeating this phrase, what it's meaning. And we'll go into some passages too. I want to show you this passage in Hebrews 2. We see here that even if Abel's, a, angels believed on Jesus Christ, they can't be saved. Right? Why? Because Jesus Christ did not take on the nature of angels. He took on the seed of Abraham. Right? So to only man has a saviour. Angels do not have a saviour. So when angels sin, they are condemned to hell. Right? They don't have a second chance like we do. So thank God for that. All right? So now, after he makes this point about, like, hey, don't have a dead faith. You want your faith to be profitable to others. You know, you show your faith to others by, you know, doing works. Somebody may say they have faith, but then you show your faith by doing works. It's all about interactions with other people. He then goes on to give two examples. Abraham and Rahab, right? Abraham will spend the most time on, because there's a lot on Abraham in the Bible. <coughs> Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? So see how we, people read this passage. They just assume, oh, he's just, his salvation is justified by works. But is that the context of the passage? Is the context of the passage justifying yourself in the eyes of God? No, because the passage is all about showing your faith to other men. So what it's saying here, Abraham our father was justified by works, justified in the eyes of who, you should ask yourself? Well, it's justified in the eyes of men. That's what James 2 is talking about. When he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Again, here, I always point this out in verse 22, and these are sometimes things you read, you're not really thinking about what it's meaning. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by faith was made perfect. You see here, it's not that God sees how faith was wrought with his work. He's saying, seest thou, you see the works, Right? See us down. I don't think those words are there accidentally because I think it completely fits with the context of the passage, right? See us thou how faith wrought with his works, and by faith, by, and by works was faith made perfect. See, so if faith is made perfect by works, doesn't that mean faith has to be there in order to be made perfect? So some people say, like, well, you know, if you don't have works and the faith is not there, if that was the case, then you can never have a dead faith. Because how can you have a dead faith if faith can't exist without works? 
And the fact here that faith is made perfect by works, that means faith has to exist first in order to be made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, it was imputed unto him for righteousness, he was called the friend of God. Verse 24, again, these, these words I don't think are here by accident. Ye see them. See, you see. A man, not God. You see them. How that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So justified in the eyes of who? You see. Right? Seest thou. Right? Now, it says here, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? But this is the key point. Because this point actually proves that this whole passage has nothing to do with Abraham's salvation. We already talked about the sort of the first bit from 14 to 20. And we can already see from the passage, if we actually look at it closely, it's not talking about at all salvation. It's talking about your faith in the eyes of men. And, he's, and, he, and now we can see that with Abraham, he's making the same point that he's using Abraham as an example of the things that Abraham did, he, justifying his faith in the eyes of men. When was it? When Isaac, his son, was offered upon the altar. But this is not when he was saved. Right? Because when we compare this, and this is why if you want to debunk James 2, you have to be very familiar with Romans 2, uh, with Romans 4. Right? Because these are the parallel, these are the, sort of the, the two passages that are talking about the same person, but James 2 is talking about Abraham's faith in the eyes of men, and Romans 4 is talking about Abraham's faith in the eyes of God. And look at the difference. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So you see there, like, well, who's, who's his works justified before in James 2? Man. Here, how does he get justified in the eyes of God? It's not by works, because he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. You see, so when you work for something, you get a reward. Remember, eternal life is a gift. It's not a reward. It's not something God owes to you. It's not a debt. It's something that's given to you by grace because you cannot deserve it. Right? But to him that worketh not, no works, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So look at this. Verse 5 is actually describing a dead faith. You have no works, remember? Faith without works is dead. So here, you have faith without works. It's a dead faith, and yet that justifies you before God. So what doesn't it justify you before? Men. Right? Because men don't know that you have faith or not. Right? Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man under whom God imputeth righteousness, right? so he credits righteousness to our account because of Jesus, without works. Right? So you have no works, you may have a dead faith, but if that dead faith is on Jesus Christ, you will be imputed righteousness. Right? That's what Romans 4 is talking about. Okay, So you can't mix grace and works. Right? Romans 11.6 If by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more works. It's very important to understand that we can't mix grace and works. And that's why, you know, it must require faith without works to be saved because if it required faith and works, it wouldn't be grace, right? It would be, if it required grace and works, it wouldn't be grace. It would be works, right? So that's why the, what you receive, what you're believing is by grace alone, okay? So salvation depends on the existence of faith, not the type of faith. Does that make sense? So the people say, oh, there's different types of faith, right? Yeah, there's, there's a living faith, right? They say a faith that's alive is bringing forth life, and a dead faith, it's not bringing forth life. And people will make you think salvation is dependent on the type of faith you have, right? So they say, well, you have a living faith and you're saved, you have a dead faith and you're not saved. Whereas I would say salvation is dependent on the existence of faith, right? But not on the type of faith. We go on in Romans 4, we see here, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is, is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness of then, then upon the circumcision only, upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? 
not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe that they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So that passage is basically saying that Abraham was justified in the eyes of God by faith, by through grace, not of works, right? And it was reckoned unto him, it was imputed unto him, even before he was circumcised. And circumcision was a sign of the faith he had, even though he wasn't circumcised. Now, we look quickly at the timeline of Abraham. It, you'll see something very interesting. And it's just kind of like, we're just like sort of nailing down what James 2 is teaching, which is justified in the eyes of men. We see here in Genesis 12, this is the promises, well, this is when Abraham is actually called by God. Now, the Lord had said unto Abraham, unto Abram, so this is before his name was changed to Abraham, it was Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Right? So this is the blessing and the cursing in, in Abraham that it was given. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and, their, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sechem, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was there then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the, right, on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, there's a bit of dispute over is this, you know, his salvation or not? Um, you know, was he just calling upon the Lord for help? I personally believe this is when he got saved. Right, because the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I think this is when um, Abraham actually got saved in Genesis 12. Now in Genesis 15, we see here the passage that is being quoted in Romans 4. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So, I believe Genesis 12 is Abraham's salvation, but I believe Abraham believing God here about him having a child because he, he didn't have a child and he's saying, you know, I don't have a child, was, was just being used as a picture of, you know, Abraham having faith, right? The fact that he believed that God was to give him a child. Um, and, and this is a picture of, you know, God's grace, right? This is what made him righteous, right? But we see here, remember, the, what made him righteous was him believing this, that he was going to have a child, and then later we see the fact that he was willing to sacrifice his child was the works that we all saw, that, was, that he actually believed this, right, as well. But remember, his salvation was Genesis 12. Genesis 16, Hagar bare Abraham a son, and Abraham called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael, and Abraham was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael, to Abraham. So if you're sort of missing this timeline, he was 75 in Genesis 12 when he called upon the name of the Lord. Right then in Genesis 15, he believed God was counted for righteousness. Genesis 16 here, we see he's 86, and this is when Ishmael is born. Genesis 17, Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were brought with him, with his money, every male among the, the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. So this is Genesis 17, where Abraham receives 
the ordinance of circumcision. How old was he? Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him. Oh, wait, that's turning over Genesis 21. So Genesis 17, we see here he's given the ordinance of circumcision. He's 99 years old. Ishmael was 13. When did he get saved? 75. All right, so it's already like, you know, over two decades that he's been saved, that he's given the sign of circumcision. And that lines up with Romans 4. Right, because Romans 4 says he was given the sign of circumcision. It was a sign of the faith which he already had even when he wasn't circumcised. Now we see the birth of Isaac. Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare him Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God hath commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. So a year later, right, he gives birth to Isaac after he's given the sign of circumcision. Genesis 22. This is when he goes to sacrifice Isaac. Right? So I'll just skip over the first couple of verses because we already know this is when he's, God tempts him. He goes and he's going to take Isaac and he tells his servants, we're going to come back after we go to offer, burn offering. Right? Verse 5. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, look at this, and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. So, <coughs> how old is Isaac here? We don't know. But he was old enough to carry all the wood required for the burnt offering up the mountain. So what is he? He's probably at least 10 or plus, right? 10 years old enough. He's strong enough to carry things up. <coughs> Abraham took the wood, laid it upon Isaac took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went of them both together. Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. So it's a beautiful way that the King James Bible has worded this, because it can mean two different things. God will provide himself a lamb. So he's saying God himself will be the lamb. But it also can mean that God himself will provide the lamb. And we know later he provided the ram. So the ram was in the thicket. I don't think that's an accident because who was the lamb that taken away the sin of the world? That was Jesus Christ. Right? And then Genesis 25, these are the days of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, 103 score and 15 years. And Abraham gave up the ghost, died in a good old age, an old man full of years was gathered unto his people. So he lived until... 100, three score, that's 60 and 15 years, 175. So he lived until 175. So what do we see from this? It proves that James 2 is talking about being justified in the eyes of men. Because remember, when in James 2, as it says, when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar, right? And that was at least, I would say, 35 years after he got saved at 75, right? Because remember, he had Isaac at 100 if we assume Isaac is about 10 years old or more, carrying the wood up the hill, that's 35 years between when he got saved and when he was just. So, so did he only get saved when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar, even though he called upon the Lord 35 years later? So you see, it's very clear that we understand the timeline of Abraham that James 2 is not talking about salvation. Right? It's talking about showing your faith in the eyes of men. The last two verses, Rahab, is also showing the same. Right? Rahab, likewise. So the fact that Rahab's two verses at the end here begins with likewise, it means in the same way Rahab is being used, in the same way Abraham is being used as an example. Right? Of what? Abraham showing the fact that he believed that Isaac was his son. He was willing to offer him as a sacrifice. Right? His works were showing that he believed that. But when did he get saved? When he called upon the Lord in Genesis 12. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works. Now just stop there, right? Now if you're going to use a passage to say, oh, you know, if you've got the works and you know, you're know you clean and that's how you show that you're saved, I mean, you're not going to use a prostitute and, and still call her a prostitute and say hey, she's an example of having a living faith, right? So it's, it's, very, it's very fitting, I think, that Rahab the harlot is being used here 
as a justification, not for salvation, right? Even because she was saved. You know, it's, it's talking about her works here, right? Because she was a harlot. So it's not even talking about, you know, that she's had it all together, right? What did she do when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now what I like to, and the last passage I just want to go to is Joshua 2. Because when we go to the story of Rahab the harlot, right, we also see that this, what she did here, was just an outward show of faith she already had on the Lord Jehovah. <coughs> Joshua 2. <coughs> so the story of Rahab, remember, they're about to, you know, go into Jericho, right? Before they go into Jericho, the nation of Israel, they send two, a few spies in, two spies, right? Where did Rahab live? Rahab lived on the wall of the city, right? Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two, spy, two men to spy secretly, saying, go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a, a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. So sometimes you wonder, you know, these two spies going to the city, what are they doing going to a harlot's house? But let's not ask questions. <laughs> Somehow, they went to a harlot's house, you know, naughty spies went into the city. They Rahab and lodged there. Lucky they came along to Rahab and actually saved, helped them. Was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in here tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. So they know that they've gone into Rahab's dwelling, right? And, uh, you know, possibly she's like, you know, sort of running like a motel, right? Come to search out all the country. And the women took the two men, and the woman, this is Rahab, took the two men and hid them and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out, whither the men went, I and what not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. So it's like when the soldiers come to like say, hey, where are those men that are staying with you? She, she, she obviously hid them up you know, under the flax. I think she, uh, yeah, the stalks of flax. She's telling them, well, they came to me, but before dark, they already left. They, they went out of the gate, and maybe if you go chase after them, you'll catch them before they go. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax when she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan uh, unto the fords, and as soon as they were pursued after them, they were gone out, they shut the gate. So isn't it funny? They go out and chase after these, they go and try and find these spies, and then the, the soldiers that go out, they actually get shut out of the city. <laughs> and before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof, and she said unto the men, so look now what she says to the spies. I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came up out of Egypt. So you see how Rahab, she's hearing these things and what the Israelites are doing as they come out. And what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. So you see how she's already heard the, work, the works of Jehovah and she's believed on Lord Jehovah. And as soon as we had heard these things, our heart did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, look at what she says, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. So even Rahab's example in James 2 shows when you go to Joshua 2 that she believed already and the works were just something that she was showing to the spies later. Because who was Rahab justifying herself in the eyes of? The spies. Right? Because the spies needed to trust her. Right? And they said, you know, they go on later, you know, hang this thing out and everything like that. So, anyways, hope you learned something there today. Now you're hopefully a lot more, even more familiar with James 2. And hopefully something that you'd forgotten about James 2, you were reminded today if you're familiar with it. Hopefully that strengthens your faith in the Word of God and really solidifies that salvation is by grace through faith. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And uh, thank you, Lord, that, you know, James 2 may be a tricky passage for us because it's misused. But, Lord, it's teaching a very good lesson, right? That we don't want to have a dead faith. We want to add works to our faith. 
But Lord, may we always remember that we are not justified in your eyes through our works, but we can show our faith to man through our works. So Lord, help us have a living faith, help us have a profitable faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.